people who wouldn't agree on what day of the week this is agreed that the Department of Justice was becoming almost a terrorist organization with respect to state, local, and even federal public officials. That's what causes change. The people in power begin to get hurt by their own system. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Harvey Silverglade. He's the co-author of The Shadow University. He wrote a great book called Three Felonies a Day. He's a co-founder of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education and a great civil libertarian. Harvey, thanks for talking to us. It's my pleasure. This is going to be interesting. You have written a lot about overcriminalization uh, in, in, in American life. What is overcriminalization, and you know, what are the egregious forms that it takes? There are two allied concepts. There's overcriminalization. Too many things have been made into crimes. But then there is a, a, a kind of a vicious relative, and that is uh, statutes that are so vague that no normal human being can figure out what it is you can so do. So what's, uh, what's an example of over, something that's been criminalized that shouldn't be, and then what's an example of a statute that is so vague it can mean anything? There's a, this enormous number of statutes and regulations in the country. Federally, um, uh, there are hundreds of, thousands of, hundreds of thousands of regulations under each of the federal criminal statutes. So if there are about 30,000 statutes, there are at least 10 times that many regulations. And counting every day, regulations are added. These regulations, which nobody can assume, it's not a matter of common sense. You can't assume that, you know, um, you, uh, 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 you know, walking in certain areas of a federally protected forest is a crime. But it's not even posted. You're just assumed to know it. And um, you can be picked up and you can be charged. And these are real criminal violations. What are the three felonies a day yesterday that you, you committed? There's this federal statute, wire fraud, okay? That means if you use the wires of interstate communication in order to further a crime or a fraud, you have committed a federal offense, okay? So <clears throat> you're, a, you're a salesman, let's say you're on the telephone with a, a somebody you're trying to sell, a computer system or anything, and you, uh, you're puffing a little bit, right? You are, you're uh, sl arguably slightly exaggerating the robustness of the system, you know, the kind of thing car salesmen are most famous for this. Uh, but any kind of salesman, um, and you're, um, you, you're, 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 if that conversation was recorded, a prosecutor can pick out something which arguably could say, ah, you use the wires of interstate commerce, the phone, mm -hmm. in order to perpetuate a fraud. You told a lie with a, a, a goal of selling somebody something that wasn't quite as good as you made it out to be. Uh, <coughs> You've committed a felony. Are people actually being um, prosecuted on that, or is this kind of like a sword of Damocles that is hanging over our head so that it's just a pretext? And if we don't even know we're breaking the law, does the law actually govern, govern our actions? Well, yes, people are being prosecuted. One of the reasons people are being prosecuted is we have too many people working for the government mm -hmm. and not enough useful work for them to do. So you do have this phenomenon of government people looking mm -hmm. for somebody who's committing a crime. So if you know you're a Bobby Unser and you're you, you've got a uh, you're taking a sled ride and a, a, a power sled ride and there's a storm and you you accidentally go into an area of federally protected land where you're not allowed to have the snowmobiles, um, he he got charged mm -hmm. uh, in that case. It was completely. Uh, accidental that he got into that area because of a storm, well, he's prosecuted. And these are the kinds of crimes for which in good intent uh, is not a defense. Uh, there's no what we call mens rea requirement. You don't have to know that it was a crime to go over this invisible line. Now, you know, mens rea comes up a lot because we are talking about um, sentencing reform. We're talking about, you know, changing a lot of this. And that Criminal seems, justice reform, right. adding a yeah. mens rea requirement. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because it seems, uh, you know, critics say, oh, that will let, among other things, that'll let corporate malefactors off the hook. The critics, 
the cynicism of the critics of mens rea reform, uh, you can't, uh, there's no way of overestimating mm -hmm. the cynicism of these people. They're saying it would be a terrible thing because the people we don't like, corporate executives, mm -hmm. they will be able to get off by arguing that there's absolutely no criminal intent on their part. They, you know, so you want absolute criminal liability for people you don't like. However, when they come after you, suddenly you say, well, you know, I didn't intend to break the law. They want a separate set of laws, essentially, for the people they don't like, a separate set for themselves, their allies, and their protectees. Why isn't there a mens rea component already in place that is robust enough to well, arrest this? First of all, um, a lot of people don't realize this. Federal criminal law is not related to common law. Mm -hmm. So state systems have large common law elements. Rens rea is a common law protection. In order to convict somebody, you have to show they meant to commit the act and they knew that committing the act violated the law. Those two elements are necessary in common law courts, mostly state courts. The federal system, that's not true. Federal system, op system operates by statute. And if you want to have a mens rea requirement, the statute has to provide it. An enormous number of federal statutes do not provide. And by the way, that's probably accidental. Uh, you know, legislators don't always know what they're doing. Um, and then there are these hundreds of thousands of regulations, each one of which has the, uh, uh, the uh, power uh, an effect of being a separate criminal law. And they are made up by bureaucrats. So uh, there's the number of missteps you can make in the course of a day just in the federal system is frightening and enormous. How did we get here? What are the political, the cultural, the legal um, <coughs> mindsets that and actions that brought us to a world in which we're always already guilty. Um, it, was it by design? Was it by accident? Is it a combination of, of the two? I think that it is largely accidental. It kind of grew like topsy. Uh, part of it was the vast increase in the last several decades of the bu bureaucrats. And bureaucrats, think about bureaucrats is that they need something to do because we have way too many federal employees, way too many state bureaucrats as well. And when you have... Although we have fewer federal employees per capita than we did in the Kennedy administration. Well, that doesn't mean that the Kennedy administration ha was right. the same yeah. time either. Yeah. It, it, it hasn't been a sane... I mean, the 20th century was not a sane time for the right. federal government. So weirdly in American life, and I know as somebody who came of age in the 60s, um, you know, the, the fight was always against the bureaucrats, whether they were in big business at GM or at the Pentagon or on the college campuses. Um, where, who is, I mean, are the bureaucrats self-multiplying or, or like nobody likes bureaucrats, right? So why, why do we keep getting more of them? Well, they are self-multiplying in the sense that they're constantly telling the system, whoever is doing the hiring or allocating the funds, that they need more people in order to perform the function. On the other hand, they partly establish what the function is. So we have an overlawed society, and in order to in order to carry out the task of, 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 of enforcing these laws, you need an increasing number of bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, in, in the colleges it's gotten especially bad. You've got many, many colleges that do not have the money to hire uh, faculty members who are on tenure track, so they hire adjuncts who are paid very small amounts of money. You can get somebody who paid three thousand dollars to teach a semester course, and you, so the students are not being taught by seasoned, experienced, mm -hmm. tenured or tenured track professors. They're being taught by part-time adjuncts who, during the day, you know, or at night and have the other jobs. And the cause of that is the the, the rise cause of, of that the... is that so much of the money is sucked up in order to support an ever-growing 
bureaucracy, the student life bureaucracy, is just monumental. Are you optimistic that we're going to be paring back some of the overcriminalization or the mass statutization of, of American life? I think that we are on the verge of a massive reaction against overweening federal power. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean because people have become libertarians or people have become federalists. I think it's much more unideological of that. Mm -hmm. Guess what? People have become targets. Mm -hmm. People have become defendants. Everybody knows somebody who was prosecuted for something that either shouldn't have been a crime or they didn't intend to do anything criminal. And everybody knows somebody or everybody has somebody in their family. And as more and more victims of an out of control system pile up, they are starting to wake up about, that's why there's a movement now to, uh, to effectuate mens rea reform. You know, too many stories are now being told in the newspapers about somebody who got up in the morning, didn't intend to commit a crime, did something, and ended up, uh, ended up with a prison sentence. What are the hinge points? What are the key things that have to happen to make sure that uh, you know, this urge towards de-bureaucratizing our lives and, and de-lawyering our lives actually hits home? So many people now have been, have been uh, hurt by the system, and including, and this is critical, members of Congress, members of state legislators, Governors who have been indicted. Uh, this is the, you know, they just argued uh, former Virginia Governor McDonald's case in the Supreme Court. I come before you this evening as someone who has been falsely and wrongfully accused and whose public service has been wrongfully attacked. Earlier today, federal prosecutors filed criminal charges against me and my wife, Maureen alleging that we violated federal law by accepting gifts and loans. And the lawyers for Virginia were obviously quite taken aback. They were getting hostile questions from all but one. I think they were to in total shock. Why is that the case? There were amici briefs filed by an enormous number of former attorneys general, state attorneys general, a few federal attorneys general, former governors. Uh, 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 all ganged together, people who wouldn't agree on what day of the week this is, agreed that the Department of Justice was becoming almost a terrorist organization with respect to state, local, and even federal public officials. That's what causes change. The people in power begin to get hurt by their own system. Let's talk about free speech, um, yeah, particularly on college campuses. You co-founded the Foundation for Individual Rights in um, Education. Uh, you also co-authored The Shadow University with Alan Kors. Talk about when you started FIRE, how bad things were, and then are they better or worse in the intervening years? When I co-founded uh, FIRE with Alan Kors, I assumed that FIRE would have about a 10-year life. We were not looking to start an institution. Uh, I thought that uh, it was needed uh, in order to deal with a temporary uh, public uh, panic and insanity. Uh, you know, suddenly the mid 80s speech codes and academic campuses on campuses that were liberal arts campuses, speech codes, certain things you couldn't talk about, um, kangaroo courts to enforce the speech codes. Um, I figured it was such, there was such dissonance uh, that presented by these uh, institutions growing up on the campuses that if we did a little pushback, just a little pushback, this edifice would collapse of its own, uh, its own idiocy and inappropriateness. Inappropriateness is a very important word because you're talking here about liberal arts colleges where free speech and free ideas are supposed to be paramount. And so I figured 10 years and then we would go out of business. Uh, little did I realize that things were gonna be getting worse during those 10 years. Talk about an early case you know, that helped uh, push you to, to create fire and then talk about how nowadays that wouldn't, you know, it almost wouldn't even register. Well, I'll tell you what got us to start fire was the publication of the Shadow University. It came out in 98 and suddenly Coors and I were getting of phone calls and panic 
letters from people on college campuses who were in trouble for doing things that no sane human being would think was a violation of uh, any reasonable instance. rule. Oh, uh, saying something uh, uh, that injured the feelings of a fellow student or an administrator or a faculty member um, and uh, uh, of, of demonstrating politically outside of a free speech zone. We had thought that whole campus was a free speech right. zone. Not true. They would segregate the people who had the audacity to want to, uh, you know, voice their uh, sometimes unpopular views. They would put them in a little corner away, away from the center of the campus, and if they ventured outside of that little corner, they were charged with a form of trespassing, actually. The free speech zone is a small triangle on campus. There's really no regular foot traffic. When we measured the size of the free speech zone, it came out that it was only 0.1% of the entire land area of the main campus here. We had suddenly had all of these phone calls and letters from students who were being charged uh, with things which seemed to be normal life on a college campus, uh, and so we couldn't handle it. You know, we, there weren't enough lawyers trying to handle it, so we started FIRE in order to process all these and try to, uh, n number one, find help for the students, and number two, we undertook the task of writing letters to the presidents and to the deans to explain why it is that this particular action could not be a violation, this particular action couldn't be a violation. If you have a rule against this, it's the rule that's the problem, not the student that's the problem. And I figured, you point out to an administrator how absurd the administrator is acting, surely the administrator will see the light of day. Well, no, not how the administrator reacted when we started to uh, harangue them is they hired more assistants to deal with us. So you're, you're part of the reason why college is so bureaucratized and costs more money. No, they have their own reasons for being bureaucratized, but I will admit that many campuses have a couple of bureaucrats who are tasked with dealing, you know, if fire calls, you know, how to deal Putting with fire. Putting out the fire. Right. We knew that we were, yeah. we were arriving at respectability when they started to teach how to deal with in us. In universities, there was this flourishing in post-war colleges as college became more mainstream and more mass, uh, you know, more people started going, there was a move to get rid of in loco parentis, the idea that you would go to college and the college would act in the place of the parents. And it was no, college was a place that, you know, and this started in the late 60s, came fully online in the 70s and then was ramped down or shut down in the 80s. But, you know, college was a place where it was a free play zone, an autonomous zone for the students, and you could direct your own lives, you could direct your own education. That vanished. Uh, and then also you talk a lot about the effects or the uh, influence of Herbert Marcuse's concept of repressive tolerance. Talk a little bit about why in the end of In Loco Parentis was so, seemed to be so brief, and then also how Marcuse is still kind of guiding a lot of activities. Okay. The, the gradual almost disappearance mm -hmm. of In Loco Parentis had another aspect to it that you didn't mention, but that is crucially important. At that period of time, the colleges opened up the admissions process, and you suddenly got on campuses that were basically, you know, took for centuries or decades, took white Anglo Saxon Protestants. Right. Suddenly, there were people of different religions and no religion. There were people of different races. Uh, there were people different of genders. different I mean, genders. Most different, of the elite schools were yep, single were sex single until gender. the early 70s. So suddenly you had co education, uh, and you, su so you suddenly had all of these different students who were probably not living together in the neighborhoods where they grew up, which were much more segregated. Um, who were suddenly living together on the same campus. Campus administrators made an assumption, fatal assumption, that without adequate supervision by adult bureaucrats, student life bureaucrats, these students would kill each other. And so they immediately ramped up the student life bureaucrats, and you know what bureaucrats love to do, they write rules, and suddenly the campuses were less free than they ever were. And uh, my own view is that was the fatal mistake. Why? Because 
students actually get along fairly well if left alone. And I've, I mean, I've seen it. I've dealt with students my entire legal career. They do get along. But when you've got bureaucrats who operate on the assumption that they're prepared to kill each other, and that sort of permeates everybody's thinking on the campus. And suddenly you have all these rules to keep students from uh, assaulting each other, from embarrassing each other, from talking uh, in an upsetting fashion to each other. This is on liberal arts campuses where you're supposed to talk in an upsetting fashions because you're trying to say things honestly rather than always sugarcoating them, right? That's the nature of these are liberal arts institutions, searching for the truth. And um, so you, you had this bureaucracy working counter to the ethos of the liberal arts institution. And this started and they started to adopt speech codes. Suddenly, on a college campus, you couldn't say something that upset somebody. Literally, this was written into a code. And if you said something upsetting, the student can complain about it, and you were suddenly charged. What? So that's how fire, you know, we have a very big spe free speech um, a component of our work. That's how it started. When you look at college campuses now, 17 years later, why are they worse? What is driving it, and then what are the chances of pulling it back? This is the dark side of accepting federal money uh, if, you're, if you're running a university. The dark side is that 99 point something percent of these colleges are now dependent on these infusions of federal funds. And all the Office of Civil Rights has to do is say, if you don't hire three more bureaucrats in the Office of Sexual Assault Prevention, we are going to find you deficient. In, this, in regard to uh, dealing with sexual assault, and you're going to lose X millions, X tens of millions, X hundreds of millions of dollars in federal funds, even though I doubt there's a college in the country that couldn't win a lawsuit very quickly if there was an attempt to take away their funds. They cave in instantly. No guts. What changes positions in the Office of Civil Rights? Is it the bureaucrats there? Is it the president who appoints the secretary of education? The bureaucracy has a life of its own operates on a trajectory of its own. It's, there's so many of them, it's even hard for the president to know what is, who and what is in the bureaucracy and what they're doing at any given time. And you know, occasionally there's a congressman who, usually somebody who has a kid in college and has heard some horror stories, you have a congressman who asks for a congressional investigation. That's how some of these things come to the surface. But essentially, the bureaucracy has a life of its own. It's self-governing, self-perpetuating. And in order to get rid of it, you have to kind of, you know, the, the expression, pull it out root branch. Um, the, uh, the office should be abolished, I, I, I simply have to say. Um, I don't, it's not reformable. It's got a culture that is inimical to the whole concept of higher education, academic freedom, due process and fairness. They don't understand uh, any of this, much less have any fidelity to it. The office should be abolished. Talk a bit about Marcuse and how his ideas are still at play, even if people uh, inhabiting them or using them don't quite understand. Yeah. Well, Marcuse in the 60s came up with what I would call um, to use a John McCainism, a wacko theory. According to Freud, the more intense the repression in a society, the more what happened is a mobilization of surplus aggressiveness against this repression. The wacko theory, uh, put as simply as I can make it, is that in order to achieve true equality, Rights have to be assigned differentially. People who are in the victim classes, lower socioeconomic classes, certain racial classes, they, in order for them to achieve equality, they have to have more rights than the people who are at the top of the totem pole of the pecking order. They have to have decreased rights. So this idea of Equality is achieved by having differential assignment of rights. You would think it's a self, you know, it's like 
It's a sick joke in a way, but it gained a lot of traction in academic circles. Where else could something as wacky as this well, be let me, accepted? Let me, let me and interject now it though is, for a second, because I mean, isn't that like if you say you're, uh, you know, it's 1964 and you're black and you're poor, you might get more money from the government in order to level the fact you know, that you haven't had certain advantages. I mean, this is affirmative action, essentially. Affirmative action uh, has real problems because it operates on an assumption of a differential assignment of rights. That has real downside. And how we could avoid affirmative action uh, you know, there's the process of, uh, of, of, of uh, lowering standards for certain students to get into college. We can avoid that by giving them a decent education in the first place, from mm -hmm. kindergarten on. Instead of dealing with that problem, at the, when they've graduated kids who really can't read very well, who can't write very well, who, don't, who haven't read much history, they graduate these kids and they're suddenly having to shoehorn them into colleges for which the kids are ill-prepared. Well, and then with the Marcusean idea of assigning differential rights, of course that implies a bureaucracy or a system that can identify you know, the, the, the inequality and rectify it. And right. that's You've what got we're a, seeing. Somebody in, yeah. has got to establish the categories right. for the undermension, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be separate separate the ubermension from the undermension. Somebody has got to decide who's in what category, and um, those are the favored categories. They're allowed, uh, you know, they're al allowed uh, uh, heightened speech rights, for example. So this is really quite Marcusean. Uh, a person who's in a privileged category, they can easily demean somebody by what they say, who's in a lo less advantaged position. But the person in a less advantaged position can say what they want because there's no way they're going to be able to hurt the person in the, in the higher position, in the more favored position. So you've got differential assignment of rights. It is the enemy of legal equality, and legal equality is the only thing that protects all of us. You know, we live in an age where uh, Reason interviewed Edward Snowden a while ago, and you know, we—he was in an undisclosed location in Russia, and he said, "You know, the individual has more freedom and ability to act in the world than ever before." Um, do you, you know, and it's true. I mean, in terms of free speech, we are in orders of magnitude vaster. We can say what we want and reach audiences and connect and preserve you know, our thoughts. Um, and on the other hand, we're looking at places where the Obama administration has been terrible to journalists in particular, uh, where the government is surveilling everything that we say and do, that college campuses are like you know, re-education camps. Um, so are we, you know, is free speech moving forward or is backwards or, you know, how do you feel about that? You know, when I was a young kid, uh, this may have been before your time, I don't know, uh, Mad Magazine, um, we read every issue of Mad Magazine that came out, and there was a, there was a, there, there, there was a feature called Spy versus Spy. There was a, a white-clothed spy and a black-clothed spy. No racial uh, overtone. Only today, would, if you if you drew this cartoon on a college campus, you would be disciplined, of course, because they would read it as a racial comment. But it wasn't. And I kind of see the world through Mad Magazine. From several reasons, I see yes. the world through the eyes of Mad Magazine. But one of them is that it's a spy versus spy. The forces of repression, the government uh, using the latest electronic uh, device uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, uh, they're fighting the, the, the private citizens, the, uh, the techies, the journalists, the people who want to find out the government secrets and let that s secret out so that the people who vote, after all, know what they're voting for. And so this is a, this is a tension. Who's going to win? Well, my, probably neither side is going to win, and that's okay with me, uh, as long as no, the so government doesn't lose, win. Right. As long as we don't lose, um, that's okay with me. What it means is that the preservation of liberty is a constant struggle. What's new about that? Absolutely nothing. Um, and but do you worry, and I know Greg Lukianoff, the, the, the current executive director of FIRE, um, talks a lot about how in this context, both in terms of on college campuses and more broadly in, in society, that the very idea of free speech is 
under, it, it's not even that it's under attack, but that it's, it's kind of vanishing. The problem, the thing that has gotten, I think, Greg so upset, and what has me upset, is not that it's vanishing, not that it's under attack, it's always been under attack, but it's under attack from quarters that once we could count on as allies, and that is academic community, the college community, those, those folks are now largely the enemy. We have to fight them. And while we're trying to fight the government, we're also trying to fight the bureaucrats and the other oppressors on the college campus. You know that you've been investigated by the FBI yes. at least three times. Mm -hmm. Talk about those cases and how you, uh, or instances and how you discovered that. In one case, there was a, cr clients were being indicted for a drug operation and there was an attempt by the prosecution, the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Boston, to freeze and uh, uh, forfeit all of their assets claiming they were drug tainted. That's done by the government in order to disable them from being able to pay for legal counsel. That's really what, the government didn't need the money, but they didn't want these people to have money for lawyers. And so, uh, for private lawyers. Uh, and so, uh, we were trying to get witnesses to sign affidavits and testify that the money that these clients were using came from a private real estate business that they had rather than from any kind of drug business. So this guy comes in, he says, oh yeah, he said, I've dealt with your clients before and I can testify that to some of the real estate deals they did and that they made money on them and so forth. Um, so I said, oh good, well, we'll have you do an affidavit. So he dictates the affidavit, have it typed up, uh, bring it in, and he's about to sign. He says, by the way, you know, uh, none of this is true, but I really like your client, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign it. And at that point, I smelled a rat. I said, well, wait a minute, don't sign anything. I walked around, and I saw he had a white kind of flowing Muslim shirt on, um, and uh, sort of a Lawrence of Arabia type <laughs> shirt. And I go on back, and I see that there's a but there's a, there's a lump in his back, a square lump. And I realized it's what they call the Kel set. It was a small, what was then miniature recorded, and now much more miniaturized. And I realized that he had been sent in by the government. So um, I said, no, no, um, you don't know, you don't understand the system or our role in the system. I gave him a civics lecture talking to the recorder, naturally. And I said, I'm afraid we're going to have to send you home. We, we can't use your affidavit, but thanks for coming by. And we threw him out. What are the other... Uh, uh, I f and I found out years later, somebody had come across and accidentally filed in another case report that uh, DEA agents were surveying my office. They were standing outside my office, following me around to see what I do. And I was being investigated by these thugs. And they had gotten the wrong guy. It shows you this is government work, right? The, somebody walked out of my office building on Broad Street, Boston, and they followed him thinking it was me. It wasn't me. They followed him down to what was then the elevated expressway. There was a car parked under the elevated expressway. The guy gets in and has a sexual <clears throat> encounter with a young lady who was behind the steering wheel. And they're all excited. They go over to the window. They knock on the window. The guy is horrified. It turns out, of course, he's got a wife and kids at home, right? And they, they said, you're Harvey Silverblade, aren't you? And what is the guy supposed to say? Oh, no, no, I'll show you my driver's license. I'm Joe Smith, and I'm married, and my wife lives in Malden. So the guy says, oh, yeah, I'm Harvey Silverblade. So they're all excited. They've now caught me in flagrante delicto, so to speak. And this, they made... And only later did they realize they had the wrong guy. I wasn't even around. I wasn't in town that day. Talk a little bit about your um, kind of intellectual genealogy or journey. Um, you, you know, why was civil libertarianism something that you uh, came out of the womb believing in, or what, what brought you to your set of beliefs? I had a kind of typical middle class Jewish upbringing in a half Jewish neighborhood in Brooklyn. And then uh, my father, who was a furrier at the time, was having trouble with the fur union. They were sending thugs around. They didn't like the fact that he reported a crooked election. So we moved to New Jersey, where he was able to get away from the furrier's union. 
and uh, New Jersey suburbs, a uh, suburb of Hackensack. I did not like the suburbs. I was a Brooklyn boy. And um, I, I left from there uh, and went on uh, to uh, college in Princeton because I had a big scholarship. Um, and uh, Princeton was just beginning to open up to, For, to, Jews, to Jewish right, yeah. kids. Uh, uh, and um, w with no money, I got a full scholarship. And uh, my parents uh, and my grandparents, of course, told me I was going to go to medical school and be a nice Jewish doctor, just like, you know, uh, that's what they came over from Russia. That's what they escaped from Russia and Poland for, so I could be a doctor, right? That's a heavy burden. And then at the end of the, my sophomore year for that summer, for the first time, I left the territory of the United States and I went to abroad. They got me a job, Princeton got me a job, paid for my transportation, I work in Paris. And it was my first time out of the country. I was away from family for three blessed months that summer and I rethought my entire life. I came back deciding that the things that people do to each other are much more bothersome to me than the things that germs do to people. And I decided I was going to go into journalism and I was going to go to law school so that I could understand the legal system better. So I went, started out law school with a journalistic career in mind, ran into Alan Dershowitz. It was his first year at Harvard Law School. My first year, we became friends. And by the third year, he convinced me I should try to, I would, should work, take the bar exam and work in a legal office for a couple years to see whether I wanted to actually be a criminal lawyer or a crime reporter. And I went to law well, I, I got out, I got a job with a very interesting little firm that did criminal defense work. I did some First Amendment work. And I decided that I would be a little bit of both. I would be a practitioner and I would write about it. And there were very few legally trained people those days who wrote. I was one of the first people I wrote for the Boston Phoenix, a, um, you know, a countercultural uh, newspaper that actually wrote the the, my criticism of judges, mm. um, lawyers, it was unheard of to criticize a judge in print. Um, the assumption was that you would lose your, you know, they wouldn't like you, you wouldn't do as well in cases. Quite the opposite. Suddenly, I got treated very well, I got treated fairly. They weren't friendly, but I got treated fairly because if they really did terrible things, I would write about it, you know. And um, so uh, fear is a tremendous, uh, um, uh, power. Uh, and um, they don't like, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant. It, it's true. Who are your legal heroes? Uh, Alex Kaczynski in the Ninth Circuit. You know, there's somebody who, uh, he doesn't care if people like him or not. He tells, he tells the truth. He writes legal opinions. He holds prosecutors' feet to the fire. You know, naturally, I, I thought Clarence Darrow was a, somewhat of a role model. Alan Dershowitz was a great influence. We did a lot of cases together. And for a while, I was ahead of him because I had more experience. Because, of course, a brilliant uh, strategist and an appellate lawyer. Um, and so, um, and I've had some law partners who've had a lot of guts. Uh, um, and, uh, so it's really the people who make the system work, though. It's yeah, not, yeah, the people who make the system work are the people who are not afraid to say, to, you know, the old, old truth to power, who aren't a lot, who aren't afraid to say when a judge or a prosecutor or an FBI agent are totally out of hand. Just as an endpoint, you are writing a sequel to Three Felonies a Day. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the title and um, what do you hope to accomplish with that book and when will we see it on our shelves? Well, Three Felonies a Day, remember, was a book that talked about quirks in the system that, that easily, easily could result in the conviction of innocent people. I had represented enough people where they had been convicted and sentenced to long prison terms for not doing anything that I would consider criminal, just as an ordinary, you know, reasonably uh, au courant human being. And it had a tremendous influence. I was actually surprised. Um, lawyers were getting in touch with me. Uh, defendants, people who were in prison, who had cases that were equally as outrageous as anything I wrote about. And then I was getting 
kind of confidential communications from judges. That told me that the system was really broken and even judges, some judges, understood it. A lot of them robotically played along and some of them cynically played along, but everybody realized that the system was broken. And I even heard, believe it or not, from a few federal prosecutors, mm. uh, the condition that I never mentioned that they contacted me and I'm not about uh, to mention well, it now. Well, that was my next question. But. And um, it, it couldn't be tagged as left or right. Uh, because I talked about victims on all ends of the political spectrum and, you know, businessmen and artists and, and some quite ordinary, uh, ordinary people. Uh, and uh, so Roger Kimball said to me about two years ago, you know, Harvey, everybody tells me that your book is brilliant in setting out the problem and totally deficient because you don't suggest the solutions. I said, well, when I wrote, read the, wrote the book, I wasn't sure what the solutions were. And besides, you told me I already had a manuscript that was twice as long as it could be. He said, I want you to write a follow-up to the book that suggests solutions. And I want you to make it simple enough so that legislators can understand it. That's a challenge. Legislators can understand it. Everybody can understand it. And I'm hoping to have a manuscript this December to my publisher. It'll come out sometime next year. It's called Conviction Machine, How to Dismantle It. And Errol Morris, the documentary filmmaker, uh, working with me to try to uh, put together a series of shorts illustrating the problem that the system has, both state and federal, mostly a federal problem, of the absence of what we call mens rea requirements and statutes. We've been talking with Harvey Silverglade. He's the co-author of The Shadow University, co-founder of FIRE, author of Three Felonies a Day, and he, uh, the forthcoming Conviction Machine, How to Dismantle It. Harvey, thanks so much for talking with us and the work you do. My pleasure. Thank you. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.